Uh, so we'll call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, July 25th. Order. Everybody please uh, rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, President. Uh, the agenda this evening um, in our communication section, uh, one minor change, there is no educational presentation uh, tonight, so we'll strike that. Or Gabby, you're going to do a, I, a I can just give a brief overview okay. since she didn't make oh, it here tonight. Okay, so, okay. so we'll fine. still do that then. Okay. Uh, brief President's report, no school board reps tonight. Um, superintendent's report, and then we'll open it up for public comment. We have the consent vote agenda to approve updates from program and personnel and facilities and finance committees. Uh, brief property committee update regarding the Brainerd building. Uh, do we have an update from CEDAW? Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing from the Illinois Association of School Boards. And then we will be convening into an executive session uh, this evening um, to discuss collective negotiating matters and employment of an employee. I don't believe we'll be taking any action right. tonight. Okay. And that's it. All right, uh, educational presentation. Yes, um, tonight I was going to be joined by Tara <coughs> Nieves, our English <coughs> department supervisor at Vernon Hills High School, to share some information with you about digital curriculum, which we are investigating in District 128. Um, this is a very big trend across the United States, and you probably know that many programs now at the university level um, are requiring students to take online courses, some of them and they have that as an option. Well, there actually are, I think, three states now in the United States that have passed um, legislation to have high school students experience at least one online curriculum um, before they graduate from high school. So as we're uh, investigating perhaps digital textbooks, we're looking at digital curriculum. About a year ago, we investigated a product called Apex Learning, and we've been using it to help students um, recover credits they might need to graduate. Um, we've had some students in special situations where we haven't been able to offer a course for them, and we've had to find either a course through a university in Oklahoma or somewhere else to help them fulfill, perhaps uh, finishing a capstone course like AP German where we've had low enrollments. And um, this curriculum has helped us out. This Apex Learning has a full catalog of a lot of courses um, at various levels. It allows you to customize the curriculum um, and it's um, kind of a nice provider for a high school to be able to have. We've had a couple of seats um, for the past year and actually have had two students finish an online course to help them graduate and to uh, recover credits that they've needed. We also um, began to investigate it as we've trained more teachers in looking at this um, for some of our summer school courses. And this summer we're piloting it in our English department and Tara has really become a leader in this area working with some teachers and with Paul Reef at LHS. They customized our summer school English courses and we've had 30 students working through an online curriculum um, and they were able to pick the units and the lessons they wanted and the students are working at their own pace. In two days the first semester will end and Tara left me a note that all of the students, probably about 85% of the students are on target for finishing the online course. The kids came in very enthusiastic, very motivated. I was there on the third day and uh, some kids were already working farther ahead. It really was um, nice for Tara to be able to differentiate her instruction in a wide range class for the students who really needed it, but allow <coughs> some students to work ahead on their own. Um, at first, she was going to just have them do it during class. They wanted to do it at home. Usually summer school, we don't give a lot of homework, but they were saying, no, turn it on. We want to work on this at home. So it's been really exciting for Tara and the English teacher, uh, Danielle Young, to um, kind of pilot an online curriculum for the first time in our district this year. And um, we also had two chemistry teachers who are looking at creating a digital chemistry course, perhaps. So. Um, it's been exciting to look at uh, some di digital curriculum and how we might incorporate that, integrate that 
um, as an, an alternate way for some of our students to be learning. And so I uh, just wanted to, Tara just was really excited about it and she said I'd love to tell the board about it and unfortunately her son fell ill today and she had to go home and be with him so she has a young son. Does this allow us to in any way a district to leverage instructors, teachers across more students and attempt to more self self-taught type thing more so? You know it could be. Um, I, I don't think you still need a teacher to to facilitate the learning in the classroom. Um, I think the summer school was a good way to start with this because for those English courses, it might be students who need to recover a credit or maybe they did poorly and they want to reinforce their skills. So she's been able to kind of work with a wide range of students using this curriculum to help them continue to learn. And um, so I think it's, you know, it's the future. Rather than adopting a textbook, this might be something we choose to do instead. Um, it might be, we're, we're kind of investigating what would the cost be rather than buying a $200 really expensive heavy textbook, would it be as cost effective to just give them a digital curriculum? Something like for a seat in a digital class where the teacher could customize the lessons and it would be right there online for the students to use um, instead of a textbook maybe. In a class of 25 students, at the the load on the teacher, is it any different? Uh, they were all online versus in the class. I, I understand the facilitator part. I'm, I'm trying to, want, I'm just looking at that, I'm still at that leveraging. I'm wondering if there's, there's an opportunity in the future or it's gonna become more self-teaching, more self-taught, or do you have any sense of that? Of what I mean, I saw her in a room with 28 kids in a lab and she's pretty busy because there are lots of questions that come up. I still think that that ratio might be about the same even if they're learning digitally and if if you're using a digital curriculum it doesn't mean that the teacher still isn't doing some lessons that she might introduce or some other activities they might do together but there might be some things she can stop and start the program too in other words she can say everybody can work on their own until you get to this point then we're going to stop and do an activity together that might be something that she wants to do <coughs> rather than just alone so it's, it allows a blend of that. And I can I make a couple comments? I did, having done some of this, been, had some exposure to this myself, and having taught a couple classes using certain digital and online tools, it the benefits really become, uh, as Deb was saying, the differentiation of really working uh, with these kids where they are. But that's also sometimes leads to even more effort on the instructor's part because you dealing with all these students at different levels and you're answering questions individually, you work far more one-on-one -on -one, even though it's digitally potentially, but it doesn't, some people will automatically think that because it's all computer-based, it'll reduce the instructor's workload. A lot of the things that we've learned in, in the higher ed world is it actually does somewhat the opposite. It actually increases the instructor's workload in terms of how you're working with the kids. Instead of getting that mm -hmm. question once in the classroom, you might get that question 12 or 14 times from different kids in different ways, and, and you have to answer each one individually. So and you have to, you also have to monitor, uh, having done some of my uh, doctoral work um, electronically, um, I think my professors who were from universities all across the country for the courses that I took, um, would say that it probably amplified their work because there's a lot more interaction among the students that's created in the course room. So the whole idea is students prompt up answers, they may prompt up answers to questions, and uh, then are required to respond, you're required to respond to a certain amount of learners, and that's what creates the dialogue uh, within the classroom, referencing whatever classroom materials you're using as your um, reference source, and then you still have you know, research papers or projects that you're working on, or I guess labs and chemistry all that you still have to have um, you still have to have a lab, but you know when when you get to Harvard's and Stanford's and the Northwesterns of the world who are offering uh, solid coursework electronically. I mean, it's it's going to be in the mix. It's going to be part of that mix, and it is eventually. Deb and I were just talking about this last week. It is going to change. It's already changing uh, the dynamic and the delivery of instruction. And so, I think the real answer to your question is yet to be seen. Uh, I, I ponder whether this would actually, this differentiation that you can do electronically would, would uh, 
to mitigate the need for a, a charter school or some other uh, need to <laughs> bring kids out of the uh, public schools. The other comment I'd like to make is I think it's terrific that we start that at this level because those students are going to run into mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. when they get to the college level because the statistics show that there's, uh, I just read a statistic, it's something like 30 to 35 percent of the college students on campus taking traditional college coursework experience at least one course online in some kind of digital format as part of their program. And it's just inevitable that's going to increase and they're going to see that. So it's good they're getting the exposure now. And because it's so prevalent, there's a consortium of universities that are offering a whole list of courses free, tuition free. You won't get credit for it, but they're offering a lot of these free now and professors are teaching them free online. So it is, it is uh, probably in the future for our, these students. And so we're starting to explore it. And it's been kind of an exciting process as these group of teachers got in and took, took a look at it and then kind of created this course this summer and then are doing it. They've learned a lot as they've gone through it. They're keeping good notes and they're gonna share with other teachers in the fall. So they wanted to kind of tell you about that. Thank you. Well, as you all know, tonight marks a retirement and the last District 128 Board of Education meeting for a distinguished educator, esteemed colleague, and good friend, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction, Deb Larson. In over 30 years at District 128, she has dedicated her professional life and contributed her heart and soul to one mission, ensuring that all stu students grow and that all students achieve at higher levels. As a mathematics teacher and department supervisor at LHS, as an assistant principal for curriculum and instruction at VHHS, as a District 128 director of personnel, and most recently as District 128 assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction, Deb has positively, positively affected and touched the lives of thousands of students and their parents, hundreds of teachers and support staff, and a number of administrators in and outside this district. In her roles as a teacher and administrator, Deb has always modeled the highest level of ethics, lifelong learning, and the unlimited possibilities that exist when dedicated, well-educated, and creative teachers connect with students. The result, everyone has benefited from working with, being taught by, and knowing Deb. Her legacy as an educator, colleague and friend will rarely be matched. There is only one Deb Larson, and she will be simply impossible to replace. Deb was my first hire when I joined District 128 as the Associate Superintendent in July 2005. And in over 20 years of hiring administrators, her hire as the new Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction back then will go down as one of the best. Working closely with Deb to create a curriculum and instruction vision and goals and then to develop and implement the plan to build upon the district's legacy of academic excellence are among my favorite memories of working with Deb. Those initial conversations, many subsequent conversation, and lots of hard work by administrators, teachers, and support staff over the past seven years resulted in unprecedented gains in student achievement, including historic level ACT scores, historic numbers of students taking advanced placement classes, taking AP tests and passing AP tests with three, four, and five scores, and a top 2% academic ranking among all public high schools in the United States. Such gains in student achievement would have not been possible without the significant leadership, unique abilities and skills, and the passion of Deb Larson. And as an ode to the future, Deb's anchoring of our work in curriculum, instruction, assessment, and feedback will ensure that District 128 students continue to grow and achieve at higher levels for many years to come. With that said, I'm honored to call Deb Larson my colleague, my friend, and my hero. And I thank Deb for her years of meritorious service to public education and to District 128. My life and the lives of many others has been profoundly touched by this very special woman. Please join me in thanking and recognizing Deb Larson.
Thank you, Prentice. That's That was just a very wonderful surprise and a very wonderful um, statement that you made. And I do want to thank this Board of Education and all the past board members and boards who have supported and encouraged me over the past 30 years. As I've said before, it's been a wonderful time to be here in this community, an exciting time to be a part of the changes we've gone through and uh, to, to really see all the positive work that so many people have done. And I'm really happy to have been a part of it and feel just truly blessed to have worked with all of you. So thank you again for the contributions you made to my life and uh, on behalf of my whole family, just um, I wish you the best and um, I'll be around. <laughs> we still have Jonathan at LHS, so we'll be around. We'll see each other. Thank you very much. Okay, um, <clears throat> President's report. Uh, just one thing, I just want to say thanks to everybody for all their hard work at the end of the year. Uh, two wonderful graduations, lots of uh, really inspiring end of year events. <coughs> Again, a lot of hard work on the part of a large number of people to make that happen. So uh, thanks for all of your hard work. Um, Superintendent's report. Okay, good news. Uh, as always, uh, first, congratulations to the District 128 Special Olympians along with Coach Andy Compton on their amazing finishes at the State Summer Games held earlier this month at Illinois State University. D128 Olympians medaled in the following events in bocce ball, singles. Uh, gold medal, Trevor, Trevor Furman. Gold medal, Michelle Shepley. Silver medal, Ann Jenkins. Uh, silver medal, Val Paykina. Silver medal, Nick uh, Zachary. And bronze, Ellie Goldberg. In doubles, Chris DeRose and Michelle Shipley earned a silver. In track, Mallory Marvin earned a gold in the 200 meter and a bronze in the 50 meter. Michael Ivers earned a gold in the 200 meter and a gold in the 50 meter. And uh, Eduardo Aguilar earned a bronze in the 200 meter. In swimming, Lauren Steen earned a gold medal in the 50 meter and uh, also won a gold as a part of the 4x25 relay team. So congratulations to our Special Olympians. They are um, continuing on a roll. The Vernon Hills High School Wind Ensemble, under the direction of Randy Sundell and Dave Tribley, has been selected to perform at the 2013 Illinois Music <coughs> Educators Association Conference. This is a joint concert with the uh, Hawthorne Middle School South Symphonic Band under the direction of James Garbrecht. It is an honor for the Vernon Hills community to have the bands from Hawthorne Middle School South and Vernon Hills High School perform at this state conference. The, former, uh, the performances will be on Saturday, January 26, 2013 at 9.30 a.m. and 10.15 a.m. The women of Vernon Hills High School choirs will also be performing at the IMEA conference. The women will present a newly commissioned work by New York-based composer Robert Convery, entitled Working Girls, a five-movement work for Trouble Voices Piano and String Orchestra, based on the poetry of Illinois poet Carl Sandburg. Over 80 women in the choir, plus members of the Vernon Hills High School Symphony Orchestra, will perform on Friday, January 25, 2013, in Peoria. The world premiere of this work will take place at Vernon Hills High School in mid-January 2013. And finally, Libertyville High School senior Joseph Allmiller is among 98 high school student representatives throughout the United States chosen to attend the American Legion Boys Nation in July. Delegates are selected from the state based on leadership skills, academic record, and activity at American Legion Boys Day. The week-long program introduces the students to the structure and function of the federal government, while combining lectures and forums with visitations to federal agencies, institutions, memorials, and historical spots in and around Washington, D.C. The program is designed to inspire a strong devotion to America while providing a practical view of federal government procedures. So congratulations to Joseph. Uh, next on the superintendent's report, as you will note in your board packet, we have uh, four donation acknowledgments. Uh, first, we received uh, from Mr. Joel Hoffman of uh, Vernon Hills a donation of $500, uh, which will be used to support our Special Olympic teams. And um, also a thanks uh, to Mr. and Mrs. John um, Scheuler 
uh, who donated $200 to the Reed Stewart Memorial Fund at Community High School District 128. These contributions will be used for special projects for learning disabled students at Liberty Hall High School. Thanks to Mr. and Mrs. Brian Snader, who donated $15 to the Reed Stewart Memorial Fund uh, at uh, D128. And again, uh, those contributions will be used for the learning disabled at Liberty Hall High School. And finally, uh, thanks to Mr. and Mrs. John Vernasco of Libertyville, who also made a $100 donation to the Reed Stewart Memorial Fund. So we're greatly appreciative of those contributions. Uh, the board will note that we had um, three, four FOIA requests uh, this month, as noted in your packet. And President Green, that concludes the superintendent's Good. report. Thank you very much. Anybody from the public would like to speak? No? Okay. Uh, so moving on to the consent vote agenda, which is listed here, was reviewed earlier in committee. Can I ask for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda, please? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur. Aye. Hanson. Aye. Dolly Polly. Aye. Committee. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Bradford. Aye. All right, motion carries. Program and Personnel Committee, Chairperson Mauer. Okay. Um, we first have uh, requests for additional educational support personnel and student activities requests. Um, and with those requests that were earlier discussed in committee, um, we have the need for a part-time teacher support clerk at Vernon Hills, moving that position from five hours a day to uh, full-time instead of part-time. Um, rationale is that the responsibilities of that position have expanded to include eligibility and additional PE duties that now require full-time status to support all teachers. We're also requesting that um, we change the position of an audio-visual technician at LHS from 10 months to 12 months with a salary adjustment. Um, that increase of technology use requires additional support during the summer months in the way of installation, maintenance, and repair. And it's a 12-month position at Vernon Hills currently, so that would um, make the positions the same. It, under activities, um, we have need for a Special Olympics person at both LHS and Vernon Hills. Due to the diverse nature of multiple events and the attention needed for supervision, we feel that there's an additional stipend that is warranted. Um, under fine arts, we would like to add a freshman sophomore play experience for freshmen and sophomores. Uh, we feel, feel that that would provide additional opportunities for the underclassmen. Um, we look at then one director and assistant director to the stipend schedule. When we look at all of those positions cumulatively, um, the changes would not exceed $27,000 in total. Um, so we are looking for a motion to approve those changes to the, or to approve the request of additional educational support personnel and student activities. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. 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 Okay, then next we have educational tour requests as listed. There are five listed. So we'd like a motion to approve those. I move to uh, approve the educational tour request as presented. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, and then finally, we're looking at the 2012-13 Ombudsman Education Service Contract Renewal. Um, that is in the amount of $33,108, and it's used to service students who are not special education students, but regular education students, <coughs> and have need for an additional alternative education placement. So we're looking for a motion to approve that contract. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Aye. 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 All right, motion carries. And that concludes the report. Thank you very much. Facilities and Finance Committee Member Arthur. We have several items on the agenda. We will begin with the prevailing wage resolution. Uh, I'm looking for a motion to approve the prevailing wage resolution as discussed in committee. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Bradford. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Hanson. Aye. Dolly Collins. Aye. Pretty. Aye. All right, motion carries. Uh, second item is a motion to approve the resolution designating interest earnings.
for fiscal year 2012 and 13. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Mauer. Aye. Branson. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Hanson. Aye. Deli Kelly. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Munster. Aye. Third item is a motion to approve the tentative budget for fiscal year 13. So moved. Second. Discussion? Anybody want to comment on this one? Yeah, I, I would make one comment. We uh, uh, want to compliment the board uh, and the administration for their uh, continued discussion uh, regarding the balance of the budget at the end of uh, the fiscal year. We've had a um, number of discussions over uh, past sessions over the last couple of years about bringing those numbers closer together, uh, revenue and expenses. Uh, that's a, uh, a discussion uh, that will continue as uh, we move forward. Um, through the budget process, but the tentative budget, uh, again, is, uh, is a budget that is a working budget that will allow us to move uh, forward into July after the fiscal year shifts while we're preparing uh, a final budget. So um, again, uh, good work on everybody's half, uh, behalf to continue to be uh, transparent in our discussion about the district's uh, finances. And, <coughs> sorry, Mrs. Shirley, what is the date to approve the final budget? Is that the August meeting? No, we have a hearing in August. <coughs> all right, so it is the August meeting, all right? Okay, all right. Okay, um, any other discussion? Roll call, please. Ratzer? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Jackson? Aye. Kelly Polly? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Okay, motion carries. And now the uh, need a motion to approve the resolution calling for that public hearing of the 2012-13 uh, budget, which will be on Monday, August 13th. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Kelly Polly? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Grasser? Aye. Motion carries. Now we will move on to bid awards. We have a number of them this evening. Uh, the first up is uh, a motion to accept the bid from Vortex of Addison, Illinois for the Libertyville High School weight room, sport and fitness surface in the amount of $12,070. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Kelly Polly? Aye. Grady? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Second item up is actually a motion to reject the bids for the Libertyville High School weight room equipment based on the fact that the specifications in the original bidding were not correct or were incomplete. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Hanson? Aye. Kelly Kelly? Aye. Grady? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Rasser? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Okay, motion carries. And now a follow on to that, a motion to accept the base bid from Pro Maxima of Houston, Texas in the amount of $74,000.17 and 44 cents to provide the weight room equipment per the specifications for <coughs> Libertyville High School. So moved. Second. Discussion, roll call please. Kelly Pelly? Aye. Rudy? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Rasser? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Motion carries. The fourth item in the bid uh, group today is a motion to accept the bid from North Suburban Asphalt of Park Ridge, Illinois in the amount of $54,000 for parking lot seal coating and crack filling <laughs> at Libertyville and Vernon Hills High School. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Grudy. Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Mauer? Aye. Bradson? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Hanson? Aye. Kelly Pollard? Aye. Motion carries. You get a long list, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the fifth item is a motion to accept the bid from 
Twin Supplies Ltd. of Oak Brook, Illinois in the amount of $56,269.84 to provide and install high efficiency light fixtures at both Libertyville and Vernon Hills High Schools. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Lundstedt? Aye. Howard? Aye. Reactor? Aye. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Valley Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Next bid. A motion to accept the base bid in the amount of $37,700. Uh, carpet tile alternate one for $7,640. Broadloom base bid for $107,300. And broad bloom alternate number one for twenty thousand two hundred from Rockford Carpetland of Rockford, Illinois, and a total amount of one hundred and seventy-two thousand eight hundred and forty. This is all for Vernon Hills carpet replacement. So moved. Second. Discussion. Roll call, please. Mauer. Aye. Grasser. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Batson. Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next up is a motion to accept the bid from Garventa, USA of Antioch, Illinois, in the amount of $28,795 to provide an inclined platform chairlift at Libertyville High School. So moved. Second. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Yes, sir. Aye. Arthur? Aye. Batson? Aye. Kelly Pauley? Aye. Three? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Power? Aye. Motion carries. Last but not least. Yes, sir. The final motion is to accept the bid from Homestead Electric Company of Ingleside, Illinois, in the amount of 72419 to provide a simplex fire alarm panel upgrade at Libertyville High School. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Arthur. Aye. Jackson. Aye. Kelly Pauley. Aye. Birdie. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Aye. Power? Aye. Grasser. Aye. All right, motion carries. And that concludes the f &M. All right, that could be a record. I don't know that we've ever had eight before, but it's we're right up there. there. I know we're not. So <laughs> busy summer, and uh, I guess my, my closing comment on that is I know that was very routine. We just kind of went through all that, but it was all discussed in great detail in committee. So Come to I just want to re meeting. reassure everybody that we had a lot of discussion on, on all those con contracts. And thank you very much for multiple bids on virtually all of them. I was amazed at some of the differences in some of the bids, actually. Okay, property committee. Actually, we have an update today. Um, we did meet again with the uh, Village of Libertyville. I would like to ask for clarification from our distinguished attorney in the back there, just to make sure I got this right. The letter, which was to say we were going to allow them to extend this thing, right, um, says we're proposing that the notice of termination date be extended to July 1st, uh, 2012, and there's no rent due prior to July 1st, 2012. Is that correct? Right. Okay, so then... So that was just to extend... The, so we could continue to negotiate. Right. The asbestos yeah, I just was, uh, I, I couldn't recall what notice of termination date be extended because well, then in the actual early termination of lease by tenant, we've extended that to December 1, 2014. Originally it was 2012. Is that right? 2011. No, 2011. Yeah, 2011. That's when we start. They, so right. we, we want to give you notice of. We'd like to extend that so we can negotiate. We've done that three or four times. Yes. And now Almost we're a year worth. doing that because we haven't agreed. Yeah. Okay. But this is really just to say hang in there until we get this thing done. Yeah, exactly. Right? And that's July. Okay. So then for everybody's uh, understanding of that, what we've done is we've extended that notice, that, that termination date to December 1st of 2014, essentially a three year extension. Um, if such termination occurs on or after that date, uh, the rent due on the date of termination shall be equal to $4,166.66 for each month in which the lease was in effect prior to the date of termination. Okay. The second thing that we uh, negotiated was the cost of the asbestos removal. And uh, basically, uh, 
if at any time the cost of the asbestos removal is less than $204,000, we pay the whole thing. Okay, that was what we expected that it would have cost back when we did the original estimates. Uh, and then there's a, there's a graduating scale. Essentially, we escalate that by about a percent and a half a year, if I recall, we, is what we finally agreed to. And so if, if termination occurs before December 1st, 1st 2012, if it exceeds 219,300, 219,300,000, then uh, we get reimbursed 7.5%. If it's between 204 and 219, they pay the difference between 204 and 219. Okay? And that's pretty much the way it's stepped out throughout the whole agreement. All right? In essence, though, the, the key thing is we agreed on this, call it inflation factor of 1.5%. All right? So. We have two things we need to approve. One is the um, uh, agreement extension amendment, which is the letter, or is that the? Uh, yeah, last yeah. time, um, I mean, we had informally agreed and Prentice signed it, so I think it's it's somewhat of a moot point. But just to clean up, have it on yeah. the record. you know, and have it yeah. on the record. That's what, why we're voting on that. Um, and then the second would be the. The actual, the actual agreement modification. Okay, so could I have a motion then to pre approve the Brainerd Lease Agreement Extension Amendment, please? So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Passes. Aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. The second thing then is to actually approve the Brainerd Lease Agreement modification, which are the details that I um, essentially just read to you. I make a motion to approve the lease agreement modification. All right. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yeah. Are we, I do. Have a sure. Question. So this is basically saying now they've got until July 1st of 2014 to give us early notice of termination. Um, yeah, so that's correct. Yeah. So they're basically in business, for, and that's fine. I think it's a little uh, after that, because it's 120, 120 days prior to December 1st of right. 2014. And, and now, if nothing happened between now and then, and they terminate on July 1st of 2014, we're just sort of back to this uh, sharing these costs of, of taking out the asbestos. And right. The, the idea in, from the original lease was if, if we can't, the village said if we can't get this done and, and the foundation can't raise a sufficient amount of money, you know, rather than owe all of this rent, we'd like to just back out and then share in the additional cost of the demolition. So there was a general demolition and then the asbestos, which was separate. Um, so yes, they can back out and they'll share in the cost um, of the demolition. If they don't, then rent becomes due, dating back to 2006, which is a big lump sum, and then every year they'll own rent until that's all paid. Right. Now, if they were to start working on this building and say over the next two years do a little bit of some other things, and then decide they can't make it work and cancel, or and we decide to tear the building down, are we still obligated to pay them back rent and they put it in the building prior to opening it up or doing anything with it? No, the only obligation, and that's in the section 1.05, is if, um, Originally, we thought we could do a 50-year lease. Turns out the school code says we can only do a 25-year lease. So because we had the idea that it would be a, an even longer-term lease, we agreed that if, in fact, uh, after 25 years, the school board at that time did not extend the lease and they had put in the improvements, then for those verifiable costs, the school district would reimburse the uh, so that is at least 25 years down the road. Okay. As I read this earlier, if, if we were to decide, if they were to cancel, we just had to tear the building down, they can come back and, let's say it was five years forward, they can come back and actually claim a reimbursement from us for money they had spent to upgrade it. Only if we don't renew the lease. No. Right. Only if we don't renew. So, so again, to Rick's point, originally we did a 50-year deal. This thing's now a 25-year deal. We have written in here that it's our intent to renew that for at least another 25. If they've put money into the building and we choose not to renew the lease, at the end of the then at the end of 25 years, then we're on the hook for whatever improvements that they've paid for. If we extend, the, if we renew the lease, we're not on the hook for it. Or if they leave, we're not on the hook for it, I recall as well. Correct. 
Right. If they choose their default to, or whatever, I mean, if they choose. If they put money into it, when they have put some money into it. Yes, they already have. Um, and they give notice in 2014 that they're, they, they want to terminate the lease, then whatever money's been put into it, we're not responsible. Right. Again, in essence, if we go back to the beginning, our key, our key objective here was not to continue to pay to maintain this building. Okay? They've, they've covered any and all maintenance costs associated with the building. Um, and uh, really, what, all, we're, all we're doing here is we're moving that period out another three years. So it's not costing us any more than the original deal. It's just giving them a little bit more time. Okay. And my last question, do we have some kind of a standard of maintenance for the building? Do they have to do certain things to keep the heat out of the winter? For, you know, there, there are no functioning the utilities in there at the moment, so. Correct. So they can, I mean, it's just sort of sitting there yeah. unused and empty. There's nothing they're required to do. They and no. and that was true. Windows. Bill, that was true when we had the building as well. Right, right. But they're required to board for windows or keep. Well, we do have some issues with windows, right? Yeah, they did. And we did it. Okay. Safety issues. Yeah. No, they, no, they did that. We didn't. Well, the side door was where our kids were playing and the balls were. Right. Because there was an issue with windows oh. being broken and right. glass falling onto the grass, the playing fields. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so are they doing that, or are they required to do that? They're not required specifically to do anything there. Okay. All right. I did have one last question that I maybe maybe I didn't do this correctly, but the lease term, section one point zero five. The lease term, twenty five years beginning on December one two thousand six and ending on November thirtieth two thousand thirty one. That was those were the original dates, right? But then if we look at the payments uh, in the amendment here. It's uh, 250 on December 1, 2014, then 50 per year payable on December 1 for 15 through 34. I'm just wondering now, should that November be uh, 2034 instead of 2031? I didn't catch that in the earlier versions. Well, that would reflect a three year extension, wouldn't it, Rick? Right. The, well, 31 the, the, and 34. the concept was that it wasn't, it, we may have to modify it, but it, the concept so. was that that um, we would just start the periodic payments later. Three years later, but they would still go for 25 years. Exactly. That's where we get to 34, right. which means that 31 probably needs to be 34. Well, th but then you're extending the lease. So it's... Uh, so in essence, the lease ends, but they pay us for three years after the lease ends? I'm just looking for your guidance on this. I just happened to find that. It Well, we would either have to extend the, the, the lease, uh, change the payment schedule. Well, the payment schedule would be 25 years from, essentially it's almost like this whole lease has been pushed out. Right, but that was- Three years. But the idea was not to extend the, the lease. I okay. mean, it was just to extend the time that the payment started. That was my original understanding, which means this page would be correct. Right. Okay, but then what about the payment part? Well, so I guess we either have to... Obviously, you do a much better job, Steve, and we cruise right through your stuff, so... <laughs> so it's my stuff that we hung up a clay right yeah. <laughs> We'd either have to increase the payments per year to get it done Which by... I don't think anybody wants to do 2031. Um, extend the lease to 2034, or... Although the lease has ended, the obligation for payments from the village could continue. Which is technically how this reads right. today, right? And you can't extend it, can you? I mean, I thought you were... Well, you just changed right. the term, right. Right. which I don't think you want to do either. I think you I want think to... We've gone out, our yeah. previous discussions were... We, we had gone out, I think, about as far as we were, the board was coming. Right, and I don't think yeah. you want to extend it out and say that the payments that the lease started in 09 instead of 06. Right. right. So essentially, we can leave it as it is, and the net result of that is, even though the lease has ended, they would they still would still owe us the, the money. Okay. All right. As long as I understand. Okay. A couple questions. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Take, take who, time. Who's carrying the liability insurance in this building? Right? Who's paying the bill set? If I recall, they are. Okay. But we still um, have our own insurance anyway. Is that correct? Correct. But they also, if I, if I recall, it falls from the district is covered. Yeah. But your second, they would be covered. Yes. 
So in order to enter in the agreement, they had to demonstrate that the, the village had to demonstrate liability insurance. Correct, correct, right? That's correct, and, and they sh should be following up uh, every year and, and providing you with notice of, or uh, documentation of it. Good question. All right, so we may have a separate committee meeting at a future date to discuss this uh, further. Okay. All right, anything else? All right, okay. Uh, so that was that was a good long negotiation, but I think it worked out okay. All right, so roll call, please. Sally Fowley. Aye. Grady. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Mauer. Aye. Lancer. Aye. Arthur. Aye. Passes. Aye. All right, motion carries. Uh, special Education District. Of yes. Uh, CEDAL held its annual meeting on uh, June 13th and conducted its usual annual um, business as uh, electing governing board officers, appointing executive board members, um, delegating certain authorities to the executive board from the governing board, establishing meeting dates. They did amend the superintendent. CEDAL has a new superintendent uh, from the beginning of this year, Dr. Moline, and there were a couple things in his contract that uh, they had to change because they, um, when, he, when they hired him, the state was in the process of changing what tier he fell under, and they thought he was under one, and he, it turned out that he was under a different one, and so they just are um, changing the way that some of the things are done to no change, no change in cost to CEDAW and no change in monies. Also with his health care, he has another policy from Michigan and uh, where he came from and there was uh, some kind of confusion with his uh, insurance claims being paid because he had these two things. And so what they did is they canceled his policy and converted it to like dental insurance or something for his family. But again, no additional cost and it converted to something still in the medical field. So. Uh, those are a couple changes. And then the other uh, major thing, which I did report last month, too, is that they um, proposed the tentative budget. And the tentative budget, again, uh, has stayed, uh, it's the same number that I reported last time, 71,337,633. It's a 3.9-ish reduction from last year. Um, however, big however, they are still in contract negotiations, and so there's no increase reflected in that number and they also are still working on their insurance premiums and there's no increase, there certainly will be an increase. Uh, originally their first insurance numbers came in at a 17% increase, they've now whittled, gotten that down to nine, they're still working on it. So that number obviously is gonna change. They did not raise tuition for any of the member districts. They had a large increase last year of 10%. This year they kept the increase at zero. Um, I think those are the main highlights of the meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Um, nothing from the Illinois Association of School Boards, and uh, other than that, we'll <coughs> reset or convene an executive session. So we have two matters tonight: one, collective negotiating matters, and the second, employment of an employee. Both five ILCS one twenty slash two C. I'm sorry, the first one two C two, the second one two C one. Thank you.